Bonjour. Bonjour. Hello, Jensen. <laughs> it's so nice to have you with us. Nice to see you, Ode. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, as you know, this week is APEC here in San Francisco. And because of some last minute changes in schedule, I couldn't make it in time. And so I had to miss seeing all of you in Paris. I was looking forward to seeing Xavier and Damien and all my friends at Scaleway and uh, seeing this amazing company, Mistral, and of course, catching up with my friend, Eric Schmidt. And so I had, I had a lot of expectations for the trip and of course, seeing beautiful Paris and you know, helping and celebrating uh, with all of you AI, because as you know, je t'aime AI, and I know all of you love AI as well. <laughs> well, thank you already for connecting at such a late hour Pacific time. That's already very generous of you. Um, as you know, we're here in Station F, the world's largest startup campus. It's home to many technological startups and especially AI startups. And I was curious about your perspective on the development and investments in AI here in Europe uh, in comparison to other regions and maybe how this relates to the availability of uh, computing power all over the world. Well, AI is developing very quickly in Europe, um, France particularly. You know, of course, as you know, as you know, um, uh, uh, France is the, the home of Jan Lacan and uh, the FAIR AI Lab. Uh, Europe is the home of DeepMind and uh, my friend Demis there uh, doing amazing work at DeepMind. And so Europe has always been rich with AI expertise. Uh, we have nearly 4,000, I think it is, uh, AI startups that we work with in Europe and 400 of them are in France. And so this is an area that is really developing very quickly. If you look at, look at um, the advancement of, of AI, you could see it in uh, several different uh, pillars. You could, you could feel the action of development, uh, starting with, of course, venture capitalists and startups. Mistral is an example of a really exciting company, Map Silico, uh, Cubit Pharmaceutical, a pool side that uh, uh, Damien mentioned earlier. I mean, these are really, really exciting uh, startups. At the same time, you have to really get the infrastructure, the computing infrastructure going. And this is the reason why Scaleway is so important to the advancement of AI in, in France, as well as AI in all, of, all over Europe. Without the infrastructure, without the instrument of AI, it's really hard for the researchers to advance their work. And then, of course, uh, the third thing that is, that's really important is the access to data. This is an, an area that, that um, uh, many companies uh, are starting to, particularly in different regions, are starting to realize that each one of the regions have their own data that they would like to train on, the culture of their uh, region, uh, the uh, specific data of their domain and, and uh, their particular industry. And so... Uh, I think that you're seeing the, the, uh, the researchers, the infrastructure, um, the availability of data, the, 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 the social interest in advancing AI developing really quickly in France and in Europe. Well, thank you. Um, well, you've said that having infrastructure here is pivotal and that cloud providers play a role. Um, how does NVIDIA work with partners in Europe, for, uh, with partners such as Scaleway, to empower all companies to develop AI projects? And what are the, the skills and the resources that are specific to cloud providers that are bringing to the table? Well, these AI infrastructure, these computers are not your normal computers, as you know. The Scaleway system that we brought online, NABU 2023, is not your normal computer. It's not a server. We call it a server, we call it a GPU server, but in every, in every single way, it's a supercomputer. And um, uh, you, you know what, you know what, could I do this? Would you mind if I shared a slide with you and just to frame some recent developments of what's going on at NVIDIA? And I think by framing that, you might get a feeling for the development around the world. Uh, the first thing that's, uh, and I'm gonna read this, from the upper left, and I'm gonna go down and I'm work towards the right. The, the first thing that you'll see is that recently, uh, we put, uh, stood online some very important supercomputers. This is the NVIDIA EOS, uh, which is the 
a supercomputer that we built for ourselves for our own development of the software stack, as well as developing advancing AI um, uh, research for self-driving cars, computer vision, uh, robotics, uh, digital biology, and so on. Uh, we built a digital twin of it, a ver uh, not a digital twin, a physical twin of it at uh, Microsoft called the Azure Ego. Uh, these two systems are now the number one highest performance AI system in the world. Nabu 2023 is a clone of this. It's an exact same version of this. So we could expect that Nabu 2023 is going to be one of the most advanced supercomputers in the world. Uh, these systems, the EOS and Azure, uh, received the number one performance in the world. It's also the third fastest supercomputer in the world's top 500. It's got 10,000 hoppers in it. Uh, we announced recently that in Germany, uh, ULIC, the, the ULIC scientific supercomputer, uh, will be the largest supercomputer in Europe. That, that has been announced so far. It has 24,000 Grace Hopper 200s in it. So it's going to be a very large system. Uh, we're in the process of, you no, know, we're not standing still. We're in the process of ramping up uh, H200, the next version of Hopper. And the reason why we're doing this is because inference requires uh, even more performance than, than ever before. And uh, with Hopper, we're able to double the performance of inference without changing anything, without changing the system, without changing the software stack. Uh, the inference performance of large language models will double. That's, that, what that says is that essentially reduces the cost of inference in half. Uh, we're also ramping up uh, Grace Hopper 200. Uh, this gives us the ability to do something really fantastic, which is expanding the NVLink domain, which today is limited to eight GPUs, into 32 GPUs. That's essentially saying we're going to build essentially a virtual giant GPU. Now, some of the things that's really important, and it has to do with uh, a lot of developments in, uh, in France related to open source, uh, is the advancement of models that, that uh, everybody could customize. And one of the areas what we've done is that we've optimized the models, optimized the computing stack, and containerized it and made it an, avail made it an API available on uh, NVIDIA's cloud. This is basically model as a service. Those models could be accessible to all of the startups uh, as a service, or you could download it, incorporate it into your own uh, services. Uh, we announced uh, NVIDIA's DGX Cloud. Uh, one of these days, I would love to have NVIDIA's DGX Cloud in Scaleway as well. And this is an area where we, this is an area where we partner with the AI startups around the world so that we could use a sandbox to develop AI together. Our engineers, and you were asking earlier, um, how do we work with the startups uh, in Europe? And the way that we do it is we have our engineers and our AI researchers and our computer scientists work together with startups to combine our expertise. And we have a place that we do it with, do it in. We call it the DGX Cloud, which is essentially a sandbox. Or another way to think about that is an AI factory. Uh, the, the two things that we announced recently, which is really exciting, and this is an, a, a real opportunity to accelerate the development of AI even further in Europe, is something that we call an AI foundry. Just as NVIDIA goes to TSMC to manufacture our chips, and we bring our domain expertise, our design expertise, and our understanding of the market, TSMC brings transistor technology, processing expertise, and their factories. NVIDIA brings our AI model expertise, our AI development expertise, and our manufacturing expertise, AI factories, and we could develop a custom AI models uh, for companies uh, all over the world. This accelerates their ability to build uh, uh, their AI services and AI applications. We announced very recently uh, four AI foundry uh, customers already. Amdocs, uh, Getty Images, SAP, the, you know, a giant company in Europe. Uh, I think some $50 trillion worth of the world's economy runs on top of SAP. They need to build custom AI models and they want to build custom AI services. And uh, ServiceNow also would like to do the same thing. By working with us, uh, they could build their own proprietary AI models they train it with their own data, with their own domain expertise, and they get to keep it. And so this, this partnership, this way of working with companies, whether it's startups or large established companies, can get them really accelerated into the marketplace. And so these different areas are the, way that, the ways that we work with 
um, AI startups around the world. And of course, Scaleway uh, works with us uh, in the very foundational part of it, starting with the infrastructure and most advanced supercomputers, all of the software stack that NVIDIA um, is well known for. We call it NVIDIA AI Enterprise that gives us uh, the acceleration layers, uh, the domain specific languages and libraries uh, from uh, data processing to training to validation all the way to deployment and of inferencing. And so, so this is a this is a maybe a, a way to frame uh, all of the different ways you could work with us. Well, thank you for sharing all of this. It proves again, if that was even necessary, that Nvidia is a leading player in AI, because you are. Everybody, everybody is always asking you for comments on maybe what's next in AI. Do you want to share with us some of your vision? Well, the first wave, the first wave starts with startups and the internet companies. If you look at where the last years of uh, activity, where the last five years of activity, uh, the breakthrough of transformers and that led to BERT and um, the generative models, uh, whether it started with GAN to variational autoencoders um, to uh, diffusion models, uh, the, the, all of these different uh, generative models uh, enabled us to learn the representation of, of data of all different types of proteins or chemicals or languages or images and, of course, 3D graphics now and video, some amazing breakthroughs in video. Um, the, the ability for us to learn the representation of different data, uh, generate uh, data of different representations, uh, really opened up uh, the ability for every single industry to be able to benefit from AI. And that energy started, of course, from... Uh, AI startups out around the world. It started from internet service companies and internet companies here in the United States. Uh, but you're now seeing the major second wave. And that second wave consists of two things. Uh, it consists of a recognition that every region and every country needs to build their sovereign AI. It's logical that there's French culture and the French language or um, various, uh, all the different countries in, in Europe, they have their own language, they have their own culture that really wants to get captured um, in their uh, uh, foundation model. Their industries are very different. So, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, rich digital biology, rich healthcare industry. And, of course, uh, Europe is also the home of some of the largest uh, industrial manufacturing companies. These are companies that are really strong in megatronics, the intersection between mechanical manufacturing and electronics uh, could be the automotive industry, the robotics industry. And so the, the different uh, companies and different industries that benefit from AI are different than the consumer internet companies um, maybe necessarily here in the United States. So I sh you're starting to see the second wave of AI, which is related to the expansion of generative AI around the world and also the adoption of AI in different industries, not just internet service companies, um, but the, the largest of industries, the traditional industries. And so we're seeing that second wave. And the thing that I'm really excited about is the application of generative AI in digital biology, which we're seeing a lot of advancements in, and also the beginnings of generative AI use in uh, industrial manufacturing. And so the world's heavy industries uh, some of the most impactful opportunities for generative AI, both in saving energy, uh, advancing uh, much, much better algorithms for optimization, uh, the, man the, the ability for us to use a foundation model for robots uh, so that uh, one model could be used uh, uh, that you could easily prompt or easily program uh, these amazing robots to do all the kinds of different skills just from a foundation model that's fine-tuned. And so, so the type of breakthroughs that we're seeing in language, I fully expect to see in digital biology and manufacturing and robotics. Lots of exciting things coming up then. Um, there's another topic that I would want to uh, broach upon, which is open source. Um, as you know, um, some AI experts in particular, in particular in Europe are very attached to open sourcing their models. And I was wondering what you think the role of open source technology in general, in particular for AI, can be. Well, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of open source uh, for several reasons. Let's acknowledge that without open source, how would AI have made the tremendous progress in the last decade? That's the first observation historical. 
Um, presently, you have to ask yourself, if not for Lama 2, if not for the exciting Mistral 7B, uh, how would the energy around generative AI be as great as it is across all of the industries beyond just a couple of two, three companies? And so the, the ability for open source to energize the vibrancy uh, and pull in the research and pull in the, uh, the engagement of every startup, every researcher, every industry is really quite vital. And you're seeing it play out uh, just presently. Now, going forward, and, and I have to acknowledge also uh, uh, Clem's work uh, at Hugging Face, uh, our good friends there, uh, really love their work. And, and I think it, it keeps the vibrancy of the ecosystem, um, the, avi- the ability for us to do research, not just for it, the innovation of the models, but the safety of the models, the guard railing, the fine tuning, um, all of the different ways that we could keep um, uh, uh, AI safe and responsible. That technology needs to be innovated in open space. It allows uh, researchers of all different types, hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world, not just hundreds of researchers, but hundreds of thousands of researchers to be able to engage this very important innovation. And so I think open source, both the, the, the technology of it, the culture of it, and I think the social engagement of it is really essential and quite vital. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, I think our session is already coming to a close, but thank you very much for being with us today, Jensen. I think I speak for everyone saying that you're welcome in Paris anytime. So please feel free to visit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.